Welcome to News in Context. I'm Gina Valeria. In this episode, we explore a massive new study on improving the health of democracy. The Strengthening Democracy Challenge invited more than 30,000 people to engage with 25 interventions. The goal was to find ways to reduce things like partisan animosity, partisan violence, and anti-democratic attitudes, as well as increase social trust and a willingness to engage with people across differences. Here to talk with me about this is researcher Rob Willer, professor of sociology, psychology, and organizational behavior at Stanford University, as well as director of the Polarization and Social Change Lab and co-director of the Center on Philanthropy and Civil Society. This is Civity Week on News in Context. Civity is a culture of deliberately engaging in relationships of respect and empathy with others who are different, moving people from us versus them to we all belong. To learn more, go to civity.org. You just headed up or co-headed up this incredible, massive, amazing, well, I think it's amazing, study uh, called the Strengthening Democracy Challenge. What were you hoping to get at by doing that? A few years ago, my lab was doing a lot of research on uh, what some people call affective polarization and what we call partisan animosity, just dislike between Democrats and Republicans. And we were starting to also do research on Americans' democratic attitudes. So of particular interest there is the extent to which Americans are committed to democratic principles and will defend them even when someone from their party uh, breaks democratic rules. Because it's really easy to punish people from the other party who break democratic rules, like, for example, by voting against them, which you'd probably do anyway. Uh, what's tough is getting people to enforce democratic principles on folks from their own side. But that's that's critical if we're going to maintain consensus uh, or build consensus on, on democratic rules. So We were very interested in both these things because we've seen evidence for trends in the American mass public of of increasing partisan animosity over the last half century. And then we also see concerning signs of democratic backsliding in the American public uh, in recent years. So we were interested in what sorts of interventions might be effective for improving both of these things, for getting Americans to, to hate one another less and also defend democratic principles over party interests more. Uh, And this turns out to be a really tricky problem. And there were lots of academics from lots of disciplines working on exactly these problems, especially the partisan animosity problem, and also lots of practitioners from outside of academia who were working on these problems too. So we we asked ourselves, like, how could we create a study that would gather as much of this wisdom uh, in it and evaluate that wisdom rigorously, as rigorously as possible. What well, if we were to try to do a study like that, what would it look like? And that's how we arrived at the the design of the strengthening democracy challenge. You talk about democratic principles. How you mentioned one, voting to censure someone from your own party uh, for the sake of this wider democratic ideal. How else are you defining are you all defining democratic principles? There were two main ways that we measured it in our study. We measured how much people supported undemocratic practices by leaders from their party and how likely they would be to vote for leaders from their party who had done these undemocratic practices. And in particular, the latter is arguably the main way in which the public weighs in on democratic rules uh, You know, in America. It's basically like, do you enforce them when they're broken? Uh, is there any sort of accountability uh, from the voting public when leaders break the rules? And what we did was we identified four different undemocratic practices that leaders might do. And then we measured how concerned people would be uh, if a leader from their party broke one of these rules. So the four undemocratic practices that we studied people's views of and and tried to identify interventions to improve people's views on uh, were the people's views of in-party leaders, leaders from their own party uh, who refused to acknowledge the results of the last election, who engaged in some sort of partisan gerrymandering, who repressed journalists who uh, were critical of their own party, and then also uh, refused to acknowledge decisions that were made by uh, judges that were appointed by the rival party. So these are good examples of ways in which a leader could break democratic rules. And uh, and we were interested in whether we could find ways to get people to defend those rules more. So how did you end up trying to measure this? We put out a call for interventions that we could test in one massive experiment, what we call a mega study. And we had one very big restriction. 
we said that uh, if you're going to submit an idea to us, it has to be something we can embed in an online survey experiment that would take less than eight minutes for somebody to complete or you know experience. And that's a pretty big restriction uh, for a lot of folks who are used to doing in-person engagement, for example, folks like Civity uh, that you know would would prefer for people to be live interacting with with someone else. Uh, and and we were worried that that would mean that a lot of folks you know, would just feel like they couldn't take part. But we were also hopeful that folks like the folks at Civity would take it as a challenge to say, is there a way to get some of what we do into this format, even though it doesn't fit what we do that well? And that's exactly what happened. We were just blown away by the amount of participation and interest in taking part. We got over 250 submissions from more than 400 uh, you know, people working you know, sometimes in large teams, submitting from uh, you know, 17 different countries, and we got submissions from activists and journalists and people working in nonprofits, as well as lots of academics from many, many different uh, academic disciplines. Uh, all these folks who don't really talk very directly to one another, but we were hoping through this study that we would convene that they would be in a kind of communication. And we put together an advisory board of practitioners and academics, and we picked what we thought to be the 25 most promising submissions to then test in this massive experiment that had over 30,000 people. So uh, roughly the size of Ithaca, New York, where I, where I went to graduate school. So this whole town kind of took part in this study. And the way it worked was that these 30,000 or so people would be randomly assigned to one of the 25 interventions that we were testing or to a control condition. And these interventions exhibited a, a range of approaches. Some were just text, you know, just people reading text. Some were interacting with a, a chat bot. Uh, others, you know, showed a lot of ingenuity and figured out ways that people could actually cooperate with somebody just in an asynchronous way. And then what a lot of folks did, including Civity, was make uh, compelling, well-produced videos that invoked some technique or another. And we had great luck with this. Uh, 23 out of the 25 interventions that were submitted reduced partisan animosity. And uh, we also found a lot of interventions that were effective in reducing support for partisan violence, uh, support for undemocratic candidates, social distrust, and, and a variety of other outcomes that are related to democracy or polarization. There's a process of story and seeing humanity and call it the conversation before the conversation, right? Be, before we work on these issues, let's make sure we trust and care and see each other, right? And so how do we do that in an asynchronous mass way? And uh, it was a lot of fun to figure that, to figure out something and then thrilling to see that it kind of worked, you know? More than kind of worked. You know, Civity's submission was that the top practitioners submitted intervention. Uh, it had, you know, effects on a lot of outcomes that were are really, really important, you know, partisan animosity, uh, civic distrust. And, and the distrust effect, you know, you all and I agreed that that effect was really cool to see because Civity really, that if there was one thing it seems to be targeted is can we build you know, trust in communities between people from different kinds of groups, not just, you know, different partisan groups, but all sorts of group differences that may undermine trust and do undermine trust in the U.S. Like, how do we how do we work on that? Yeah, that was really exciting. The The democratic practices piece is so important, but there's this foundational uh, you know, relational aspect of, of of how do we see each other? How are we in community together? How are we accepting that this other in my community is actually just as much a part of it before we even get to the idea of the um, these binaries that have been imposed on us, right? The red, blue, the pro or against whatever, which can sometimes hinder us mm -hmm. from actually trying to solve issues. Yeah. You talked about undemocratic practices. And then, of course, in the U.S., it's easy to jump to the red-blue thing, sure. which isn't what Civity does, right? You know, Civity knows that that is one of many mm -hmm. binary us-them things that we have to deal with. But um, but how did you all think about those sort of us-them things as you explored this study? Well, the main thing that we were thinking is, how do we set up the study to create a sort of level playing field where these different ideas could compete fairly, you know, like we were, we thought of ourselves as shepherding other people's ideas and we wanted to do that responsibly, but also rigorously. So like, how do we make measures of these outcomes that we could defend as, as good ways to measure these things? So like one of the most difficult ones is democratic attitudes. Lots of people have a sense democratic attitudes are 
under threat or flagging in the American public needs strengthening. But then when you start getting rigorous about what we mean by that, uh, it's a little bit confusing uh, what people mean. And if you were to just go out to the American public and survey them on how much they like democracy, you'll see that almost everyone says they think democracy is great. There's no problem with democracy. So, uh, you know, we're, we're pro that in general. There's high consensus that that word is a good word, <laughs> you know, but uh, the dissent is around what are you going to do if somebody breaks those rules? Um are fairly conducted elections actually fairly conducted? You know, things like this is where we we have troubles. And so our approach to measuring and support for democratic principles tried to get around this problem of everybody thinks they're pro-democracy, but what are you going to do about it by setting up these scenarios where it's like, okay, well, it's your party versus democratic principles. What do you do then? Because that's, I think, the central dilemma that's presented to voters in a society where they get a chance to, to defend democracy is that as much as anything. And then I guess the second way in which uh, voters get a chance to defend democracy is in terms of what they believe, what they choose to believe. You know, do people believe kind of convenient myths that fit their party identity, but that aren't true, uh, that may be threatened to undermine democracy by undermining the legitimacy of institutions like our voting systems? or undermining our kind of shared reality as citizens in a common society. So we also measured that biased perception of politicized facts. And that was the other thing we wanted to get at that that is important to democracy. So I'm a former journalist and I'm all about, you know, I I started journalism because I thought, oh, if you inform the public, then you give them information they need and then cool, off we go. And then, of course, it doesn't quite work out that way. Right. So so my search for, you know, engaging people in, you know, what I believe in democracy as well led me to to Civity. And it was really exciting that Civity was the top practitioner based intervention, that we were number one at um, decreasing social distrust. And when you talk about things like is it your party versus democracy? When you talk about things like the, these biases we hold and and are we really all welcoming to the table everyone to engage in the process and, and or are we distrustful? It was exciting for us, of course, that Civity moved the needle on that. Mm-hmm. And I'm curious, you know, given the way you've been thinking about democracy and democratic practices and the way you set up the study, and then we at Civity come along with this, well, we don't want to talk about party mm-hmm. and we don't want to talk about, you know, we're going to do this thing. And then it performed well. I was curious, how did you and your team respond to that? We didn't really think about this going in, but reflecting on the performance of some of the best interventions, a lot of them did well in part, I think, because they didn't talk about the party difference, but they presented content that was relevant to partisan divides. So here I'm thinking of two interventions in particular. So the Civity uh, intervention involved, it presented a series of people telling their stories about who they are how they feel like they're perceived. And each one of them seemed like also kind of stereotype defying people. They had uh, views and identities and beliefs and depths that you might not guess from your sort of snap judgment of, oh, that person's probably a Republican or, oh, that person's probably a Democrat. And they didn't talk much about party. They talked about a variety of identities, you know, that they had. And then all of them came off as sort of real, authentic, people that were also sharing something, you know, intimate, intimate things about themselves. And so they're being vulnerable, uh, which I think people always appreciate and find endearing and, of course, builds intimacy. So that's roughly my sense of the civity intervention. It was great. And then another one that it reminds me of is this contact based intervention that was made by Heineken's UK outlet, which is the I think it's called Worlds Apart video. And they made it right after Brexit. They brought in pairs of ideologically Uh, divergent folks, people on the left, people on the right, uh, with really, really different views, but had them sit down and over a a glass of Heineken beer would talk through those differences. And despite the fact that they were having to drink Heineken beer, it went really well. No, yeah, I'm not a beer fan, but... I'm not a Heineken (laughs) fan. But I'm a fan of Heineken UK for doing this. Fan of the commercial. Yeah. (laughs) And it's really cool because uh, you might think, oh, why would video of ideological rivals in the UK in 2017, how could that be relevant to American Democrats and Republicans in 2022? But of course, the differences map pretty cleanly. And the kind of fundamental thing of like, you're seeing that these people have depths and have respect for people across divides and have views you wouldn't guess, you know, and characteristics you wouldn't guess. Uh, 
and are decent when they have to confront someone they disagree with, all this stuff winds up being sort of endearing and it gives you hope and it reduces your animosity for people that are politically different from you. And so both of these, I think, were interventions that were good at building a kind of generalized faith in people that are very different from you and maybe actually benefited from not just focusing on and inadvertently emphasizing the partisan divide. You know, they, neither one did that. You're listening to News in Context. I'm Gina Valeria. We're talking about the Strengthening Democracy Challenge with Stanford professor and researcher Rob Willer. One thing that I think we at Civity do is, in addition to those stories and seeing humanity, is framing it as this idea of um, inclusion. Totally. So we included also the animated videos talking about being in community with each other. It's not just meeting one person and seeing humanity. That's important. But it's then extrapolating that to expanding the, quote, we and we the people. Mm -hmm. I would venture to say that the U.S. has had a uh, a long running issue with including all of the we's in we the people. Uh, you know, we think of indigenous, we think of slaves, we think of uh, immigrants. Yeah. And that this is something that needs to be fundamentally sort of addressed to um, to ensure a healthy democracy. And 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 so one thing I think Civity wants to do, not that we not that we necessarily define ourselves specifically in that way, but the all of these divides, the the, you know, the immigrant divide, the 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 racial divide, the the ethnic divide, the socioeconomic divide, whatever it may be, is that there's lots of humanity that needs to be crossed across those divides. Yeah, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. And the approach that Civity took here, to the extent that we can measure that, it worked really well. So Civity was, you know, number one in increasing social trust or decreasing social distrust, however you want to think about it. It's the same underlying measure. It was the number two intervention, uh, and really just kind of neck and neck with number one on supporting bipartisan cooperation, um, which is a way to, you know, reach across divides to hopefully achieve some sort of pro progress. And it was also very high in increasing support for democratic reforms, like a, a set of structural democratic reforms, like automatic voter registration, which scholars of democracy believe would be helpful for making our government more representative. Items that didn't refer to party per se, they were more about, you know, increasing democratic participation for folks in general. So I would love to ask you, you know, you did this and that's great. Why? What led you to this moment in which you took on this massive, as you said, complex study? Uh, you know, why this? Why this for you? A lot of stuff has been changing in the social sciences lately. There's been the open science revolution, which has happened uh, following the replication crisis in especially the fields I'm active in, social psychology. And it hasn't exactly come to sociology, but it will. And uh, there's been an increased appreciation that we need new research designs to build knowledge efficiently and reliably and rigorously. And so I think more and more people are trying to think outside the box on well, what is a good way to do a study? What is the right way to try to answer a problem? So that was in the background. And then also our lab has always been really focused on social problems, uh, you know, not just polarization and democracy, but also economic inequality, racial prejudice, uh, sexism, homophobia. We study all sorts of stuff and views of immigrants. And we had been telling ourselves for years as a community that like we were trying to make the decisions to just produce the most scientifically rigorous, useful knowledge as efficiently as we could and then communicate it to the stakeholders that could do something with it. But if we were really being skeptical of ourselves, we, we weren't living up to that standard as much as we could have, in part because we had inherited this tradition from the social sciences that you focus on your ideas, that you try to come up with a new idea and then you try to push it forward and make a compelling case for it, almost like a like a lawyer or something. And this is not really the best way to do science, in my opinion. You know, instead, you should try to find the best ideas and yours should be among them if you have them. But you shouldn't give any extra attention to them just because they're yours if you're being properly scientific. Uh, so we said, well, what would be a different approach? And this is this is what we came up with. And, and it was very rewarding to be sort of liberated from ourselves a bit on the project, you know, uh, it took some pressure off of like, oh, we don't need this study, this data collection to support our idea or not for it to be a worthwhile study, because we designed it to hopefully be valuable, independent of the results, 
independent of how the results reflect on us, it's a it's a defensible study, you know, that's that's going to be valuable. That's been kind of revelatory for us, and we've tried to take a new approach to a lot of our work of, you know, how would we do this if we were just trying to do the work as well as possible and tried to get rid of is these inherited assumptions and traditions that constrain us. You're doing work that's near and dear to my heart as well. And how did you yourself come to this? Work? How did your pathway lead you or why did you decide to focus on trying to tackle and get at these issues? I guess I have like really specific reasons, as I think everybody does for caring a lot about the different things I care a lot about. I, I was definitely, I was raised in a very, very class conscious home and also a home that was very concerned with racial justice. And so those issues were ones that I was attuned to like really, really early on. And then I had the experience of growing up a political minority in South Carolina and really, you know, saw how alienating that can be. That can be alienating even if nobody sort of misuses their majority power on you, but people do misuse it and make you feel bad and excluded sometimes or try to intimidate you. Uh, But even if they don't, to be a minority in your community and it makes you feel alienated and not at home. And that's made me more sensitive to political diversity uh, stuff and want to make sure in the classrooms that I lead that people uh, feel comfortable expressing their views, um, that we try in our science to say, okay, what perspectives that are not in this room can we try to bring into this room, either literally or by imagining what someone would say about this work if they had different uh, priors and backgrounds than us? It also makes me just concerned with polarization related issues because I I feel like I've kind of seen um, both sides of it. I've also lived in the most liberal communities in America, like Ithaca, New York, Berkeley, California, San Francisco, and, and loved in those communities, but also saw what it's like to be in a majority, you know, blue region. So in any event, I, I guess I, I'm concerned about the polarization democracy stuff, as well as having a, a bunch of social problems that, that I'm concerned about and, and just trying to do work that's relevant to, to all of it as much as we can. Yeah, no, it, it is funny to me how many people doing work in this space had an experience of being othered or being marginalized, and um, and myself included, and, and and how that does attune you a little bit to wanting to get at that issue. So I appreciate that. I just really want us to have a free flow of ideas and respectfully receive them and surface and consider the evidence. And I want that so that I can refine my views. So if people disagree with me, I have good reasons. I want to hear them so I can improve my own views. But also, I want to potentially win some debates too. Like let's, let's, let's talk about it. Let's have difficult conversations. Let's, you know, let's make our cases to one another and maybe we could make more headway that way. You know, I don't want to prejudge people or disrespect them for disagreeing with me because it's not going to be very effective. Exactly. You know, like they're never going to agree with me. If, uh, yeah. If I condemn their views before we've talked. I agree 100% with what you just said. I feel the same way. Um, so you've done this thing that's seemingly quite valuable and, and brought out some really interesting information to light for us all, where do you go from here? A lot of places. I think one thing that we're doing is we're trying to push these results to to application a bit more. Uh, So if there was a big gap in the study we did, it's that it's conducted in the context of a a survey experiment. That has certain advantages for sure. Uh, In a survey experiment, you can use a representative sample of Americans, and that's a powerful thing to be able to say these results generalize to the U.S. population. You know, another thing that's good is it's, it's, Pretty easy to test the ideas in parallel with one another, controlling for lots and lots of things. You know, we've reaped whatever benefits from these strengths of survey experiments. We want to move past it to uh, look at behavior out in the world and see if these results uh, can really help practitioner organizations like Civity do what they're doing, uh, you know, better and figure out also the features of what they're already doing that are that are most efficacious. So we're now organizing a grants competition where we're pairing practitioners and researchers to uh, submit short grant proposals to us uh, that will fund at least five of these. We're trying to address the big shortcoming of the study we did by going that, that extra mile. And then we're also trying to take the thing that we did do and apply it in new contexts. So we're doing a replication project in the Israeli-Palestinian context, uh, which we're very excited about taking some of the insights from this, but then gathering new ideas as well. Uh, And it's a different context where 
there's an intergroup conflict, but there's also a big power difference between Israelis and Palestinians that uh, has to be taken into account to do you know high quality work there. Like Democrats and Republicans are on kind of roughly equal footing, depending on how you think about it. Um, and so when you make that move to, to a different context, it involves a lot of adjustment. We're also trying to take the idea of the mega study that tests many ideas in parallel to other social problems and, and work on them. So we've done work on climate change communication and messaging in the past. So yeah, we're trying to kind of find spaces like that where we can hopefully intervene productively and boil down the knowledge to some uh, clearer takeaways for practitioners in the world. Is there anything you want to say that I didn't ask that you think it's important for people to know? You know, we learned a lot of really, really interesting stuff uh, in this in this project about about what leads people to kind of stand down on partisan conflict and, and also stick to their, their guns more on uh, defending democratic principles. And I, I'm just really, really happy that we were able to get the insights and wisdom of practitioners into the, the study in addition to the academics who are used to participating in something like this. The performance of the short video that Civity made, which performed so well on so many of the outcomes, uh, I haven't even you know fully gone through all of them here. Uh, it really validates that that was that was worth it to you know take part in this very different kind of thing. And oh yeah, and I do want to highlight two other <laughs> effects that the civity intervention had that I I failed to mention. Uh, so one is that it was uh, the number four out of twenty five interventions in improving biased evaluation of politicized facts, which is super interesting because you wouldn't necessarily guess that, but I think it it got people to sort of release their group commitments that might bias the way they think about evidence and facts, especially, you know, we were measuring facts that would be compromised by your partisan and your investment, in your partisan identity. Uh, but I think the civity intervention softens people's commitment to these divisive identities more generally. Uh, but so that's a really powerful thing to intervene on that research in social sciences hasn't identified like a lot of ways to do that. So it's pretty cool that this short video did that. And then it reduced support for undemocratic candidates, uh, which is really cool because the way that we measure this again is like you're told a scenario where a candidate from your party has done a bad thing that's unfair to the other party. Will you not vote for them? You know, uh, will you put the democratic principle above partisan gain? And that that's a tough thing for people. People aren't good at that because it's tough. You have a lot of reasons to vote for the people from your party. And so uh, prioritizing democratic principles is not easy. It involves a conflict uh, within the self. And it's its very cool that Civity got people to kind of shift their frame to caring about the society at large enough to uh, to weight the democratic principles more. This relational aspect of seeing each other, being in community with each other, uh, seeing humanity, um, being more inclusive, trying to focus on that aspect of the foundations of community. Yeah. Now people are starting to see that kind of value to be a part of what, what you all have done and to hear that Civity performs so well on these. To me, the things you mentioned are just the most critically important things. Yeah. And that we move the needle on, on a lot of that just is thrilling, thrilling. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It is really cool that we could support each other's project. But yeah, so hopefully this can help to clarify for folks who would be skeptical and reasonable to be skeptical about the stuff in the world, but they're here are real tangible effects. But it's so great what, what you all have been doing with Civity. It's powerful, powerful stuff. My hat is off to you, for sure. My hat is off to you as well. Thank you to my guest, Rob Willer, Professor of Sociology, Psychology, and Organizational Behavior at Stanford University, as well as Director of the Polarization and Social Change Lab and Co-Director of the Center on Philanthropy and Civil Society. Music in this episode includes Spring Fling by Track Tribe and The Heist by Silent Partner. In addition to hearing news in context every Friday at 8.30 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. on KSFP 102.5 in San Francisco, you can hear it on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, iHeartMedia, Google Play, Google Podcasts, Podbean, YouTube, and PRX. We're also on Facebook and Twitter at News in Context SF and on Instagram at News in Context. And you can find links to all of that at newsincontext.net. I'm Gina Valeria. Thank you for listening.